team. Bye for now. Holding on to a dream. Decisions in Scotland making Scotland fairer. Decisions taken at Westminster holding Scotland back. And that is why Scotland must become an independent country. John Swinney restates the case for independence, but what are the chances of another referendum and... I do think I was imagining scenes and, uh, well, I'm, I'm calling them scenes, not chapters. Actor Richard Armitage on being an actor who writes thrillers. Ten years ago this evening, the world watched as we all waited for the result of the momentous 2014 independence referendum. On a huge turnout, Scotland ended up voting to stay in the UK by 55% to 45%. The fallout has framed the last decade in Scottish politics and tonight pro-independence supporters held a rally outside the Scottish Parliament. We believe the time is right now to redouble our efforts and we don't think it's going to take another 10 years to deliver Scotland back to its natural state of being an independent nation on the world stage. Because we've been active, the side that, strangely enough, lost the referendum, here we are celebrating a defeat. And actually, it's more celebrating that we're still here and we haven't gone away over 10 years. The fact there's still support for independence, we know that that, that sentiment's there. How do we action that and how do we mobilise it? And it can't just be electoral. It got, it's got to be a citizen's movement. And that's what this is here today. I think that we're, we're starting to reach that tipping point now. This is 10 years on, it's a big milestone. Um, but I've still got that hope and there's so many people around here that have still got that hope. Well, one journalist who covered the referendum campaign and has continued to keep across every twist and turn of the debate is SCV's political editor, Colin Mackay. On this landmark anniversary, he joined us from Holyrood. Ten years on from losing the referendum, the Yes campaigners have been making the case for independence today. What's the, how would you describe the mood in the Yes camp? I don't think it's confident, Rona. There's nothing really much to be confident about. Ten years on, you know, it slipped down the agenda. The SNP got an absolute trouncing at the general election just a couple of months ago. But not only that, if you look at the kind of wider yes movement, there's been a fair bit of splintering. You know, you had Alba shearing off from the SNP, led by Alex Salmond, with the whole kind of big row that's going on there. There have been splinter groups leaving Alba since then as well. You've had the big row between, the, the big fallout between the SNP and the Green the Greens kicked out of government. There doesn't seem to be much lost, love lost there. Now, there was a debate in the chamber earlier on, and Lorna Slater was talking about putting the yes band back together. I'm not convinced there's any real chance of that right now. There's, a few, there's, there's just a few too many discordant notes on that front. Let's take you back a, a decade, Colin. What was it like for you covering the referendum campaign? As a journalist, it was incredibly exciting. This was probably the biggest Scottish political story I'm ever likely to cover. Unless perhaps, you know, 10 years time we get another Indie Ref 2, something like that, I don't know. But, you know, so far, I, mean, I, I can't imagine a bigger Scottish political story than that. You know, I mean, you're talking about, you know, the decision of the future of your country placed in voters' hands. That is absolutely massive. So it was, it was an incredibly exciting time to report it. Now, I think there are differing views on different sides of the actual debate though you know today you had John Swinney talking about how important it was and how exciting it was and how, how positive the whole event was but I remember speaking to Alistair Darling who, who led the better together and he said it was a truly awful time to be involved in politics from his point of view so you know I can see both sides of that politically but as a journalist it was you know it was a proper festival of politics um, 55 percent of Scots voted to stay in the union what were the main uh, factors to think behind the no win I think the biggest factor was risk. People were worried about the, the, the potential risk to the economy, to their pensions, their mortgages, things like that. And if you go back to the huge STV debate, which really kick-started the whole final stages of the campaign, the key issue that night was currency. 
what currency would an independent Scotland have? What was the plan B? You know, that, 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 that famous uh, line from Alistair Darling to Alex Salmond at the time, which was that, you know, the capital will be Scotland, the flag will be the Psalter. What will the currency be? Now, Alex Salmond's answer to that was the pound, but it was pretty much dismissed by George Osborne, the Chancellor at the time, all the other UK parties as well, saying, well, you're not getting to use the pound. And that just created that that doubt in a lot of people's mind and I think that was probably enough but it, it, fundamentally it just came down to the risk not being dealt with. And where do you think the constitutional debate goes in the next months, years? I think in the next months, the next few years probably, it slips down the agenda. You know, it has absolutely dominated Scottish politics for more than 10 years now. It has been the prism through which we've kind of worked out the whole kind of every colour of Scottish politics. And, and I think now, with the general election, it suggests that it has slipped down the agenda. The polls suggest it's slipped down the agenda. But, you know, who's to say where we'll be 10 years from now? 2034, that will be... 20 years, a generation on. It was supposed to be a once in a generation event. Well, maybe we'll be ready for another generational event in 20 years' time. But, you know, who could possibly even guess where Scottish politics will be by then? Yeah, absolutely. Colin, thanks so much for joining us this evening. If Scotland is ever to become independent, pro-independence campaigners will have to win over more Scots. We assess the state of public opinion with the pre-eminent polling analyst, Professor Sir John Curtis. So the no side won with 55% of the vote compared to 45. Over the last decade, have we seen much of a shift in public opinion? We've seen something of a shift in the balance of public opinion and arguably a rather more important one in the character of the people who support independence. So basically, in 2019, when the House of Commons was arguing about whether or not Brexit should be implemented, and if so, how, support for independence began to rise above the 45% and was averaging at around 48 49%. There was actually a spell in the during the height of the pandemic in the second half of 2020, when the polls consistently had independence ahead uh, uh, for the first time ever. Uh, that reversed by the time of the 2021 Hollywood election. If you look at the most recent polls since the general election, we're looking at about 47% of people saying they would vote yes. So a little higher uh, than in 2014, but not a lot higher. But the crucial difference is that whereas in 2014, there was no link between people's attitudes towards the European Union and whether or not they voted yes or no, now there is a very clear link between the two. Bearing that in mind, I mean, obviously the SNP had a terrible night at the general election in the summer, but mm. does the SNP have any grounds for optimism in terms of building support in the coming you know, months or years? Well, yes and no. Um, one thing which the First Minister has pointed out, and he isn't the first person to point it out, is that younger people are keener on independence than older people. And certainly that's perhaps, indeed, uh, th those of the, in the youngest age group, the 16 to 24, are clearly more uh, keener on independence than was even the case 10 years ago. And, you know, uh, if uh, attitudes of people don't change too much, then as some of our older voters disappear from the electorate and get replaced by younger people who are more pro-independence, that's advantageous to uh, the yes side. Uh, the second is indeed the fact that once you start asking people the relative merits of uh, being uh, inside the UK and being inside the EU, if they're forced without choice, then the numbers look rather better for the pro yes side than if, and this is the downside yeah. for them, you simply ask people about whether or not they want to be inside or outside uh, the UK. One of the striking numbers in the YouGov poll that came out yesterday is that actually people, when simply presented with the consequences of independence per se economically, yeah. were actually more pessimistic than they were at the time of the 2014 referendum. Well, I mean, unionists, <laughs> unionists say the issue of independence is you know, dead in the water. Is that how you see it, though? No, I think I would describe it is that the whole thing is in neutral for two reasons. One is that the event that, in effect, uh, killed the prospect of an independence referendum any time soon was the Liz Trust fiscal event. That opened up a prospect of a majority Labour government, and that meant, therefore, there was no pathway for the SNP to be able to get an independence referendum via a hung parliament. So that was the first uh, okay. crucial thing. The second thing, of course, is that the SNP as a political institution uh, are not as popular as they were, and about 20 per cent of people who would still vote yes voted for Labour in the general election. So until 
until the independence movement can begin to get the debate started again, okay. to get their car at least into first or second gear, uh, that debate's not going anywhere. But given that the country is still divided almost 50-50, to argue that yeah. the, independence movement, uh, the independence debate is dead, as opposed to at the moment just simply not uh, going anywhere very far, uh, I think it's just pushing it too far. OK, John, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts this evening. Thank you. With us now, two young campaigners on different sides of the constitutional debate. We have Osama Nadim, who's the organiser for Young Scots for Independence, and Emma Russell, chair of Scottish Labour Students. Thank you both so much for joining us. Tell me, first of all, how old were you in the last referendum? Um, I was 15. And what about you? I was only 12 in the last independence. Of course, that makes me feel incredibly old. And is that what got you into politics? Um, yeah, so I got involved back in 2013. So when I was um, 14, yeah. um, I went to a stall um, and I kind of really kind of understood and really spoke to um, the people at the stall and that kind of got, got me into politics. and. Mm -hmm. Um, also, the MSP, George Adam, he also was really helpful. He really supported me throughout the, throughout the journey and that's kind of got me along the way and I've been camping ever since. So, <laughs> and is, yeah. that what, is that what you got you politically engaged? Because there was a lot of talk about politics, wasn't there, at that time? Yeah, um, I mean, I definitely wasn't politically engaged at 12, but I would say it's what got me switched on. Everyone was talking about it. Teachers were talking about it. I mean, there was a comedy special on the telly about it. It was, it was just everywhere. It was hard to not become so turned on to politics because of it. Um, you obviously didn't get to vote in uh, 2014, but do you think there will be another one, Osama? Yes, I do. I do believe that there will be another one. Um, if you think about within the last decade, what's happened, um, if you look at Brexit, austerity, cost of living, um, the Liz Truss budget and what's happened since that. Um, and even having a Labour government, it's, it's not really showing any, any difference. Um, you have got the 22 billion black hole um, and how Kirstama has been recently, it's not really been any improvements okay. as a change that has been promised. OK, can you ever envisage another one? No. Clearly you don't want one, but... <laughs> I can't really envisage another one because I think, as you said about the £22 billion black hole, I think people are more concerned with how we get out of that and how we move forward together to create a better Scotland. I think that's the way through this is to work together. It doesn't matter if you voted yes or no in the independence referendum. What matters now is that Scotland moves forward and we start to fix things like failing public services. I mean, what's your response to that, Osama? Do you think more people are worried about just their lives and the cost of living crisis? Um, in response to that, I would say cutting, continuing with austerity is not, is not, the, is not the answer to that. Um, just having, continue on with what's happened before with the Tory government, that's not really a change that mm. Labour has said in the campaign, what they've would have been like, like Anna Sa was saying, read my lips, there will be no austerity, but there is going to be austerity. Uh, um, and, yeah, and do you think an unpopular uh, Labour government down south might encourage and might in encourage people to support independence up here? I think that the Labour government that we have in power right now has been in power for a very short space of time. So to make sort of judgments on what the Labour government has done when we're faced with this economic pit of despair is very quick. I think that as we move forward and we move on to 2026, that the way forward is through and mm -hmm. people will still be concerned with their cost of living and the pound in their pocket. I mean, Osama, what about, you know, the practicalities? How would you get one? What form would it take? Would it be another referendum? Would you have to wait to get uh, the go-ahead from Westminster? How would you see it happening? I would see it as an, like I was last time, a referendum, a democratic referendum, um, which helped both sides. Um, so I do believe that kind of the way forward. Um, talking to people, talking to each other, getting, talking to friends, family and neighbours, mm. you know, talking, having a big mo movement, a big discussion on it. And, and do you, can you foresee any Unionist party agreeing to one? Definitely not now. I think the sort of phrases that were being thrown out during the independence referendum was it was a once in a generation vote, a once in a lifetime vote, and it's only been 10 years. I think we need to not look back to this period of divisiveness in our politics. I think we need to start looking forward. But what you know, what is the democratic process by which people could, could have a vote on independence then? 
I think that certainly returning a majority government to Westminster with 37 Scottish Labour MPs is not the way. I don't think Scotland's indicated a preference there. I think we have to move forward. I don't think that every election should be treated as a process for this. And I think uh, that time does need to pass before the question comes up again for it to be truly democratic. Okay. Uh, Osama, just very briefly to finish, when do you think it might happen? Putting you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do believe it will happen within my lifetime. Um, In your uh, lifetime. We'll yeah. have to leave it there, yeah. but thank you both very much indeed for joining us this evening. Thank you. Now, the multi-award winning actor Richard Armitage is known for his roles in a whole host of films and TV dramas, from Spooks to The Hobbit, from The Stranger to Red Eye. In recent years, he's also turned his talents to writing thrillers. His debut novel, Geneva, was widely acclaimed and is now out in paperback. Last Friday, Richard headlined the opening night of Stirling's prestigious Bloody Scotland Crime Writing Festival. While he was in Scotland, he came into the studio to discuss his writing. So you have a, a really successful acting uh, career. What made you take up writing? Uh, it was an invitation from Audible who had looked at the people that were listening to my, my work as a reader. I think they'd also been looking at um, perhaps the people that were tuning into me as an actor and they sort of did some calculations and, and said to me, would you be interested in writing a crime thriller? And I immediately said, yeah, I'd love to. And then. They talked about ghostwriter, and I said, absolutely not, I want to write this myself. So I sort of had to audition my writing process by giving them little samples of writing, and then it, it became an audio book for a year, and then print, and now paperback. And had you had, you had literary aspirations? Um, the, not, not really. I mean, in, only in terms of um, dreaming in stories. So, you know, m my journey as an actor has always been about storytelling. When I've, when I've ever prepared character, I've always written biographies for them, and that has been uh, a literary experience. I've, I've sort of filled in all the blanks that the, the writer hasn't given me. And I've done it purely for, for pleasure, but also for research. Um, so I've, I've written uh, short form, but nothing at this length. OK. Um, your book, Geneva, uh, which I really enjoyed, is a really fast-paced thriller with lots of twists and turns. But where did you get the idea from? So. Um, the invitation to write came just as we were in lockdown and I'd been watching lots of uh, footage of Sarah Gilbert who developed the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine program and I was, I was really kind of impressed with her um, self-assurance and her calm uh, resilience during that time of panic and I thought how interesting to take a character like that and stress test someone by making them not trust their own mind. And I thought that's, that's the foundation stone of, of a plot, to take a Nobel Prize winning scientist and then give her what she thinks is um, an Alzheimer's diagnosis and then put her at the center of a crime where the people closest to her are not telling her the truth. And it just, that was the, the trigger for the story. Let's not give too much no, away because there are that. lots of twists and turns yeah. in it, as I said. So um, did you write it with um, a film or a TV adaptation in mind? Because it's very filmic. I mean, I could really imagine it as a film as, when I was reading it. You know, I, d I didn't, but I, I think it's how my brain works. I think I, I mean, I, I've, I learn lines in, in pictures. I see the picture and then speak the line. So I think my brain works in images rather than literary references. So I do think I was imagining scenes and uh, at, well, I'm, I'm calling them scenes, not chapters. Yeah. So I'm seeing it as a film or, a, or a, an episode. Um, I'm seeing cuts, I suppose, in my head. I'm seeing montages. I'm, I'm seeing the car go off the edge of the cliff. So I, I basically had to imagine the film and then write it down. So, so yes is the answer, but it wasn't the plan to make it a TV show. But it is now going to be turned into a TV series, isn't <laughs> yes, it? Tell me about it that. Is. Um, yeah, Sony, Sony Pictures um, really, really enjoyed the book as well. So um, they optioned it uh, with me uh, as an executive producer. And if we can get it made soon enough, I, I'll be playing Daniel. The hapless husband. The hapless husband. If it takes too long... Actually, I'll the creepy I'll, hapless husband. Yes, <laughs> yes. Although if Sorry. it takes too long, I might well be playing Moritz Schiller, the, the, uh, the old scientist, because sometimes development can take quite a long yeah. time. But yeah, I mean, I... I um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting journey this, this story's been on. And you are you a prolific reader yourself? 
I am, I really am, and from, from a really young age. I mean, it, I think it was the doorway that took me into acting was I was, remember being read The Hobbit by my primary school teacher and it was so vivid to me, her voice doing all the, all the accents and, uh, and I think that I was so stimulated by that that I, every week I would pick up a book and I have been like that ever since. I don't read so much for pleasure anymore, it's always work related because I have a pile of books waiting to be recorded for Audible but I'm lucky because I get such a broad range of brilliant writing, a lot of crime thriller. Um, and then, of course, there's all the Harlan Coben work that I've yeah. been doing, and I get all of his work as well. So he's been a, an unconscious mentor to me. And, and a, an inspiration when you're writing as well. Or Definitely. Yeah. And a friend and somebody, somebody that I can kind of call and say, oh, uh, what do you do at, the, you know, at this point in the story when you, in his, you know, he's, he's a great source of, of counselling and advice. So your, your next book, The Cut, is out now on Audible, isn't it? Yes. And it's, it's taking the same path then as, as Geneva, Audible, audiobook first, then Harbart, then the paperback. Is, yes. that, is that the way things are going to go in the publishing world, do you think? I think it's slightly unusual, um, but these, these books are actually crafted uh, for audio. So, so they're sort of um, constructed in a slightly different way. I, as I'm writing them, I'm reading them aloud. Sometimes I'll even record sections into a microphone to see what they sound like. So it's a, it's a sensory experience rather than a cerebral experience first. So it, it's, sli it's sli constructed slightly differently, although the print copy is exactly the same. Uh, but yes, um, but Faber will be publishing it in, in hardback in 2026. Sounds like years away, but yeah, 2026. And what, what's that about? So the cut is a little bit more autobiographical. It's set in a, <clears throat> in a rural town in the Midlands and it's about a group of teenagers in 1993 at their graduation. One of them is, is tragically killed and one of them goes to prison for it. And then in the present day, a film crew comes back to that village to make a horror film, but that horror film is not quite what it seems. Okay, it sounds great. <laughs> and you know, audiobooks are really, really popular these days, but some people can be a bit sniffy about them and say it's not proper reading. Yeah. But do you think anything that gets people into books in general is a good thing? I, yeah, I mean, I don't care how you get story as long as you're getting story. And, and you know, I, I always think about um, the people that I'm reading to when I sit down in front of a microphone. And I, I think about people that have got long car journeys. I think about people that are doing manual work. The guy that sculpted my face on The Hobbit, who did all of the, the Thorin um, prosthetics, I mean, I think we did 15, he did 15 versions of that face. And I would go in and talk to him and he had headphones in and he'd say, I'd be like, what are you listening to? And he said, oh, I'm listening to, to audiobooks." Yeah. And he'd get through a book a week. And I think about him and like these people that do that kind of work. And so I'm talking to those people. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I mean, I enjoy audiobooks as well. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us and good luck with the TV, the TV series. Uh, I look forward to watching Thanks it. Thank you so much, me. Richard. <laughs> And that's all from Scotland Tonight. I'll be here tomorrow at 8.30. Until then, Ed Sheeran went viral today after he shared a video of himself interacting with a passing jogger. Here's one last thing. Hello. Any requests? Um, could you, um, Tenerife Sea? Yeah. You look so wonderful in that dress. I love your hair like that. The way it falls on the side of your neck Down your shoulders and back